the celebration of the most sacred heart of Jesus goes back uh, a good number of centuries, etc. Period. I won't explain too much about that anymore. When we come also into the sacred heart of Jesus, there are a lot of devotions that will, uh, that many a country, a race, or that they have traditions about, and I will not touch on that. I will not look into that, my dear friends. I will focus what we are doing on our scripture readings and draw from them and show them, tell us about the sacred heart of Jesus. That being said, I'm trying to impress on us that this is not something which is of our time only or of the sacred heart of Jesus as so presented to us the way we have it in many of our devotions and how a good bit of that has to do with uh, First Friday devotions that you uh, attend nine First, Friday, First Fridays and with the devotions and then you get your you 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 have you bring with you your intentions etc i won't uh, talk about that uh, there are many of the different uh, sacred heart shrines and churches all over the world which does that and they do a very good job they can look into that the next that i would like to say about the sacred heart of jesus is that of as per understanding of the way the saints have given us this devotion, let me put it that way, or passed down this devotion to us, the person that stands out from the 17th century, correct? Yes, 17th century, 1640, 41, uh, please correct me. <laughs> Uh, Saint uh, Marguerite Marie Alacoque, and then now, as we know it also, with uh, Saint uh, Claude de la Colombia, uh, the former, a visitation sister, the latter, uh, a Jesuit. Now, it is through these two where we have many of our devotions and understandings of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, uh, where we anchor them by which is good, very good. Uh, and I'm saying that we, they have given us a lot of graces and we continue by all of that to, to prosper and to propagate the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I would like to add though that this is not merely a devotion, all right? We are talking about here I go again. Mystery about the life of Jesus Christ coming from Lent, Easter tide, and the Holy Trinity and the Corpus Christi. When Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, from God the Father, and here we have the metaphor of the heart and of the heart. And if we speak of the heart, the heart of Jesus in particular. All of the saints do that too and will emphasize we are not just talking about a devotion here but a mystery of the person and the divinity of Jesus Christ, the heart of Jesus Christ. For that matter, it would also mean that the heart, quote-unquote, of Jesus and the heart of God, the description using the heart goes back a long way even before uh, Saint Claude de la Colombière and Saint Mag Marguerite Maria Lacoque. We can speak of perhaps like Saint Thomas Aquinas would say that the heart of God, Scripture, the heart of God, or we speak of, for example, Saint John Chrysostom and his. Uh, prayers to Jesus, in particular, he speaks of uh, the heart of Jesus. In prayer, we say, Lord Jesus, your mercy be upon me. St. John Chrysostom, I'm paraphrasing, I'm trying to recall 
especially since this was taught to us in Greek. Or we even have, uh, alas, uh, somebody from, like uh, St. Augustine, uh, we, who is more familiar with, with a number of us as well. Uh, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, my God. And what in God? In your heart also, God. My heart be in your heart, O God. So I'm trying to impress on us as well, my dear friends, that the metaphor of heart of God, and in particular, in specificity, the heart of Jesus is not altogether new and not just of the 17th century passed on to us into the 21st century. Many of us saints have used the metaphor of heart of God to God from God and have used also the heart of man relating to the heart of God. And that is important. We emphasize the heart of Christ. Why so? We emphasize the heart of Christ because it is Jesus who became man. Correct? So we can speak of the heart of God, but more truly now, in effect, because your son who became man, who has the human heart, and from that heart flows blood, life. From that heart, the spirit of the heart. There we can speak to you, O God, through your only begotten Son. The heart of Christ is your heart, O God. And by the heart of Christ, if we speak to the heart of Christ, we can speak to you, O God. By the heart of Christ, if we know what the yearnings, the longings, and the gifts, and the mission of the heart of Christ, then we would also know the yearnings, the longings, the mission, and the grace of the heart of God. Alas, the sacred heart of Jesus. Now it just crossed my mind reminder to everybody because this is the feast of the sacred heart of jesus it's on a friday traditionally it's on a friday not on a sunday people will have to go out of their way on a friday to come and celebrate the sacred heart of jesus it doesn't have to be in a shrine of a sacred heart or the sacred heart church Proper. No. Any church, my dear friends, it's a solemnity. It's like celebrating a Sunday Mass about the sacred heart of Jesus, but placed on a Friday because it is on a Friday where Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross. But my caution, please, my dear friends, not to forget, we do not remain on a Friday, a good Friday. We always move into Sunday, Easter Sunday. Please do not forget, I think I have mentioned this before, that every Sunday is an Easter Sunday. If we celebrate and remember Corpus Christi, how the remembering from the very beginning of how Jesus did it. And every time we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we remember, we receive, and we become, we are slowly becoming a part of Christ. And we are celebrating already with all those who are a part of the body of Christ. Don't forget that every Sunday we celebrate Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, the very first until every Sunday that we celebrate is an Easter Sunday and we're always celebrating it as communion together as the faithful that gathers is gathered by our Lord Jesus Christ. But don't forget that even they who had celebrated it already are with us. Hence, we celebrate the sacred heart of Jesus and we are with they who have celebrated it before and the gift so given to them then be given unto us and into the future 
for generations to come who believe in the sacred heart of Jesus. Our first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, You are a people sacred to the Lord, your God. He has chosen you from all the nations and the face of the earth to be a people peculiarly His own. It was not because you are the largest of all the nations that the Lord set His heart on you and chose you, for you are really the smallest of all the nations. It was because the Lord loved you and because of His fidelity to the oath He had sworn your fathers that He brought you out with His strong hand from the place of slavery and ransomed you from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Understand then that the Lord God is God indeed, the faithful God who keeps His merciful covenant down to the thousandth generation toward those who love Him and keep His commandments. But who repays with destruction a person who hates Him and does not dally with such a one, but makes them personally pay for it. You shall therefore carefully observe the commandments and the statutes and the decrees that I enjoin on you today. Very clearly, from the book of Deuteronomy, God chooses His people, and it is a choice, the description so given here. The Lord set His heart on you and chose you there. To set His heart and choose, it's definitive, a definitive choice. My direction, the direction of my heart is you, on you, and I definitely choose you. And let's also be clear with regard to this. God choosing and setting His heart on you. Remember, this is a nation that He sets apart, that He peculiarly makes His own. I emphasize the fact that it is a people, not just one. It is not individualistic. Let's keep that in mind. Our God is never a selfish God. It just chooses one person, already there is a community, a people, and He sets His heart and chooses a people. That heart on the people. Now the expectation too, because I, by my heart, have been faithful to you in choosing you and being with you in directing you in your journey, I expect also your heart. Many, though they may be individual hearts, all of you gather together and as a people, choose me too. We choose with our heart. My dear friends, this is very important in Hebraic and understanding. Choice, decision is of the heart. Thought about, they muster all their strength, and then it is with the heart that they choose. And that's why they say, too, that we let us have the heart of God, that we choose with our heart and choose to be with God. That is very important, my dear friends. I repeat myself again, not to be sentimental or romantic simply about the heart and make it sound like a Valentine affair. Ah, but it's also good to take note. This fidelity of being one, one heart for my one nation, there you are. That when we too choose, we have one heart for one God.
Interesting, is it not also? Man and woman, one heart for one man, one heart for one woman, and then that which is one heart of one of man, one heart of woman, they become one heart in married life. How I'd love to explain more of that to you, that image of married life. One heart of man, one heart of woman, they marry and become one heart, one heart of a married couple. That image, choice of the heart, very clear also. Uh, we have to keep in mind also we are here in Deuteronomy and it is Moses and Moses, the Moses type of uh, showing to us. Remember how also in Corpus Christi, Trinity Sunday, we're reading Moses, the Moses type, that prophet, that choice, that fundamental direction, that, uh, uh, shall we say, that spirit remaining faithful and and being uh, that fidelity to God. And if God is faithful to us, we have to be re remain faithful in God. God chose us. He asks us to choose Him as well. God remains in us. We remain in God. There was any example? Moses. Moses and his heart as well. And he is being used as something like a type, see that man, he remains true to heart, to one God and one God alone. And yet, we all know that in effect, later on, there will be mistakes by, by that one human heart of Moses, and which points us, projects us, that there is only one heart, the sacred heart of Jesus, that remains true to one God and one God alone. Let us go now to our second reading from the first letter of John, of course. Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this, in this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might have life through Him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us and His love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in Him and He in us, that He has given us of His Spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testified that the Father sent His Son as Savior of the world, whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love, in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in Him. Now, the first thing that I would like to mention here, we are in the first letter of John, and this is Johannine Theology. Now, I, I have serious difficulty when people just use this statement, God is love, and period. And I would like to state, my dear friends, God is not just predicated with love. No. Uh, this whole section here that is so read to us explains to us what this term, God is love, what it's all about. And in fact, if we will use the last verse as our 
uh, example, not just the example, but to elucidate what I am trying to explain. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. So we cannot just simply say God is love, period, and that's it. And sort of use that as our motto or our uh, dashboard, whatever sticker. Now, I'd like us, my dear friends, to please go beyond this. It does not merely say predicate, let's not just merely predicate God with love. All right? This is more. And in fact, if you would pay attention, close attention to how I was explaining in terms of Corpus Christi and our triune God, the Trinity Sunday, our good part of that movement is already at work, correct? For example, God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God. That's remaining when it's time to remain. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and God in Him. And being in Him and remaining in Him, that is of the whole, Jesus Christ. He speaks of, remain in me as I in you, and I will gift you the Holy Spirit. Well, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. It relates to that very much so. Um, I'm just about pointing this out to you that even with this term, God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God, and God in him is already very Trinitarian. But the interesting part of this, since we are in the celebration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, my dear friends, there, the metaphor that is being used, love, and of course love, what is the symbol that, that comes to mind? And that is none other than the heart. At the heart of God is love. At the heart of a God, who is loving remains in, in, in love. And if God remains, what I mean, God is loving us and God remains in, in us in His love, then we likewise are able to enter into Jesus Christ's heart, into the heart of love into the heart of Jesus Christ. Uh, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. So we are talking about if it is the heart of God and in the heart of God is love, then we can, whoever loves is actually, shall we say, showing a part of the heart of God because God is of love? Yes, yes, there is that. Uh, but here I would like to point out again, but he adds, and knows God. It is not in St. John, to love is, does not, like I said, do not remain just in God is love. You have to know God and you have to believe in God. Uh, there is that part in Carl Ranner, where he speaks of the anonymous Christian. Uh, pardon me, okay? I, I don't mean to slam a brother of mine or anything. I do not... At, at this point, my dear, my dear friends, when we read this, it's difficult to, to, for me to see that, especially these days. We have to acknowledge that we know Jesus Christ and we believe Jesus Christ. When we are following the gospel according to St. John and the epistles of St. Paul, I can understand where Karl Rahner is coming from, from another theological standpoint, all right? But then, as far as the heart of Jesus Christ is concerned, we have to know Him, to love Him, and to believe in Him. That is what our excerpt is showing. Functions of the heart. There you are, if you want. I would state that the functions of the heart, yes, it is to love, but it is to know, it is to believe. Huh? We come from the first reading, Deuteronomy. 
set your heart definitively and choose God. For God has chosen us and He asks for a response. Do we set our heart to the heart of God? And in St. John, that means love is of God. Therefore, let us know God and believe God. Movements of the heart of God. God loves us. So let us know God, who He is, what is He about. That's in Jesus Christ. And let us believe now that it is in Jesus Christ that we know God and who helps us, guides us, guards us, shows us the truth, the Holy Spirit. To love God, to know God, to believe God in the heart of God. The three come together in our reading of the first letter to John. So I go back to my, my first statement. Let's not simply predicate God is love. We have to see the rest of that, the whole of that. And he says, God loves. And if when God loves, let us know who God is and believe in God. The final statement that I will mention here, we have to keep in mind first, my dear friends, very clearly, he says, God loved us first. The movement of the heart of God comes first, and then we respond. The height and depth, the breadth and length of that movement of the heart of God is Jesus Christ in His passion, death, and resurrection. First, God loves. God loves us. In fact, that's how I would say state state it first. Uh, state it rather than God is love predicating because I would add there God is love. Therefore, let us love, know, and believe in God. I would rather say say first God loves us, or as the name Jesus signifies. Uh, presents itself to us, or what His name means, God saves. God is salvation. God has saved. That is love. And that is in the heart of God and that heart of Jesus Christ. Rather, that heart of God is shown unto us, revealed unto us, lived unto us in the heart of Jesus, His only begotten Son. You are watching ETVN Philippines. Emmanuel, the God with us who saves. Finally, let us come now to our gospel reading. Uh, and interestingly enough, my dear friends, we are not going to read from the gospel according to St. John, but it is Matthew. Please take note. Chapter 11. At that time, Jesus exclaimed, I give praise to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the little ones. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Now, many a time, my dear friends, when it is the Feast of the Sacred Heart, we read from the Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and following, 25 to 30. Yes. Now, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, what's interesting about this, I think I've mentioned before in our lectures on scriptures how, you know, uh, how the 
evangelists use each other and how they expand on each other or shall we say dialogue with each other the best term that i used right dialogue and here we have my dear friends in matthew something which is rather chohanain and here we have a jesus prayer which is found in the book of glory of the gospel according to saint john and we have the jesus prayer in chapter uh, 14 into 15 and here my dear friends we have a jesus prayer in the 11th chapter of matthew i give praise to you father lord of heaven and earth john chapter 14 and 15 correct many would say that this is the johannine touch in the gospel according to saint matthew um some, some would say that he picked picked up certain things or maybe maybe it's the other way around how john used matthew in terms of how jesus prayed how he proclaimed i give praise to you lord jesus i give praise to you father the better term here is i confess to you father i pray to you father lord of heaven and earth i confess that you are the lord of heaven and earth and i pray to you for although you have hidden these things from the wise and learned you have revealed them to the little ones and to the little ones that he speaks of here and now in this gospel passage the little ones first and foremost are the disciples who are about him he calls them little ones because in this reading he calls his father and confesses that he is his father he is the master of these disciples following him and as master they are the little ones and he calls upon the father to look upon the little ones the paideo idea look upon the children the children whom i have gathered look upon them my friends there we are again another movement of the heart of jesus that the heart of jesus calls upon his father confesses that you are fa father and i ask you look upon your children you have revealed to your children. You have taught and are teaching your children. This, my dear friends, is very important. And I cannot overemphasize this. That the heart of Jesus is a heart that calls on the Father and asks his Father now, let us teach these children. Let us show the children, let us reveal to the children my heart. My heart that is to be offered to them. And beautiful. It's the movement of the heart. I, and that's Father Orara. I, I thrive on the theology of movement and there you have a movement. The heart of God now the heart of Christ and it is a heart that wants to teach the children the sacred heart of Jesus teaches the children and how often I have mentioned for our reflections that we are children of God is it not as children we would like to hear the story of God the story of Jesus Christ and will not the heart of Jesus pour out upon us his life story and as children can we listen with our hearts 
from our hearts. I will end with that. Let's move to the second part. I do not want to say more. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and humble of heart. And you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. Now we have to remember here in Hebraic terms when they talk, talk about yoke. Uh, they talk about that is uh, the yoke refers to the teachings, the Torah. And for them to know the Torah is a way of not just a burden, my dear friends, or let's say, no, it is not a burden, but rather when we know the law and the teachings of the Lord, life presents itself to us. I'm not saying life becomes easy. No, presents itself to us and we can live a good godly life. That is the metaphor of the yoke. The law, the teaching, I take it upon myself. And when I take it upon myself, even with all the difficulties and the hardships uh, symbolized or what uh, the image of the yoke, no problem. I can live that life because the teaching, the law, helps me live a good and godly life. And here, my dear friends, it's very important for us to see this. And this is St. Matthew. For I am meek and humble of heart. Jesus himself says, I am meek and humble of heart. Happier than meek, for theirs is. Right? When we are talking about meek and humble of heart, we are talking about a person who wants to learn. Who is able to learn? Who opens himself, herself, her heart so that they can learn? And Jesus himself says that I am meek of and humble of heart because his heart is always a heart that is open, that is able to learn, that accepts the learning, that is being taught. Let's not forget his being coming, being a man in this earth was a great part of the teaching from his father. And he has learned from all of that all the way to his passion and death and resurrection. And then now because he is meek and humble of heart and his heart has learned, has been taught. Now he teaches us to be meek and humble of heart. Now we are being asked, my dear friends, to have our hearts that open also, meek and humble, so that Jesus can teach us and we can learn from Jesus. When two meek and humble hearts meet and learn and grow with one another, the fruits of grace, the fruits of the peace and love of God are there. What more can we ask for? Once again, we're not saying that this, all of this is going to be easy, convenient, and comfortable because meek and humble hearts that are open to learning, to being taught by God, living in this world, we need to go through it. But need I ask for more? If I will open my heart and make it meek and humble, Jesus is already saying He is the meek and humble of heart. I enter into that. And by entering into that, oh, not that it will become convenient, comfortable, and easy. No, but that is my yoke. By being meek and humble of heart and entering the meek and humble heart of Jesus Christ, I can live a good Christian and godly life. 
my dear friends, so much for us in terms of all of these reflections about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I can only say that I hope I have contributed to many of the reflections so given by so many saints from the very beginning, even from our scripture, from Matthew, from John, from Moses, into the saints that I've mentioned, John Chrysostom, uh, Augustine, and then uh, Thomas Aquinas, and then Saint Marguerite Marie Alacoque Al and Saint Claude de la Colombia, into many of the great uh, preachers of, of this day, including uh, Pope Benedict or Saint John Paul II, Pope uh, Benedict, and Pope Francis, how they speak of a heart, a heart that is willing to learn. That is the meek and humble heart. But remember, God is first. I'd rather use that predication because it is Jesus who lived a meek and humble heart. And because He has lived a meek and humble heart, we as Christians can do too so that when we have our own meek and humble of hearts entering his meek and humble heart the sacred heart of jesus then we can live a good christian godly life in this world and live and continue with the peace of our risen lord and the love of god in the communion of the holy spirit in to onomati kai tu patros kai tu iu kai tu piumatos tu agio amen <laughs>